I invite you to stand as you're able for our prayer of illumination and then for the reading of our gospel. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, like Nicodemus, we come to the word with many questions. Like the Pharisees, we can be captivated by correctness, intent on right answers. As we turn to your word, Spirit of God, do not let our desire for information dominate our need for transformation. Let us hear the word and be moved to greater faith and obedience. Amen. Our reading this morning is from the Gospel of John. We'll be reading from the first chapter, starting in verse 29. Listen to the word of God. The next day, he saw Jesus coming toward him and declared, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks ahead of me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but I came baptizing with water for this reason that he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw the spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the spirit descend and remain is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. The next day, John again was standing with two of his disciples, and as he watched Jesus walk by, he exclaimed, Look, here is the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, What are you looking for? And they said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and see. They came and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which is translated anointed. He brought Simon to Jesus who looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You are to be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Christ has no body now on earth but yours, no hands but yours, no feet but yours. Yours are the eyes through which to look out Christ's compassion to the world. Yours are the feet to which he is to go about doing good. Yours are the hands with which to bless people now. These are the words attributed to Teresa of Avila, a mystic 
who was a Spanish noblewoman who chose the monastic life of the Catholic Church in the 16th century. Her words, written more than four centuries ago, give us an understanding of what we consider to be incarnational theology. It reminds us that we are to be Jesus Christ to the world. God became incarnate. In other words, God became flesh in Jesus Christ to embody God's love for the world. Teresa is taking this incarnational theology one step further and calls on us to incarnate Christ into our own selves and to love the world the way Jesus did. But I think that from our reading this morning, John the Baptist had another understanding of incarnational theology. He calls attention to Jesus, testifying to all within hearing distance, this is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. John provides testimony to who Jesus is and points to the way so that others may come to know him, to recognize Jesus Christ. And you know, we need both of these ways to fully live into the life that God has called us to. And we could add Christian humanism to go under that umbrella as well, Christian humanism is the Christian doctrine that God, in the person of Jesus, became human in order to redeem humanity, and that the church, that's us, is to act out the life of Christ. When we say we are Christians, our actions should be visible symbols of the deeper meaning of that name. We should live in such a way that when we call ourselves Christian, people associate the proper meaning of the name Christian. How do we do that? I'll give you the example of John. John the Baptist sees Jesus incarnate. He sees him coming and he calls attention to Jesus, testifying to all within hearing that he is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. He said, I, John, saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove. And it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me, God, to baptize with water said to me, he, Jesus, on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. Where have you seen Jesus? 
Where have you seen the Spirit working? How has the Spirit been working on you? I have to tell you, I, I had an incident uh, last week that taught me that the Spirit is indeed working on me. And let me tell you, the Spirit has a big job with me and there's a long way to go, but there's an awareness that I'm better than I was a couple of years ago. When have you had that kind of realization? The Spirit is working inside of each of us so that we can be more like Jesus. And telling someone about that is witnessing to your faith in Christ. Like John the Baptist, when we provide testimony as to who Jesus is, we point the way to others so that they can come to recognize him. God uses us as witnesses, not because we have the right profile or we have the right skill set. Seeing and naming what God is doing in your life is about God. It's not about us. Just as John's witness, it's not about himself. It's about God. The Apostle Paul said in his letter to the church at Corinth that we who are sanctified in Christ are called to be saints together with all those who in every place and every time call upon his name. And that brings us back to the message from Teresa of Avila. It's about being the hands and feet of Christ in the world to do his work. Yes, we're called to feed the hungry and clothe the na uh, naked, but we're also called to work on behalf of those who need forgiveness, those who need liberation, those who need empowerment for their new lives as Christians. And we do that through advocacy. We need to be people who stand up for what's right. Nelson Mandela spent 25 years in a prison and greatly contributed to the downfall of South Africa's apartheid. Mother Teresa of Calcutta treated those who had been thrown out on the street like refuge, and she treated them like Jesus himself. Those are some names we know, but there are a lot of names we don't know who work tirelessly for the good of others. What is it that we can do for others? In our scripture this morning, when Jesus realized that Andrew and the other disciple were tagging along behind him, he turned and he asked them, what are you looking for? And that's precisely the question that each of us must answer for our lives. What are we looking for out of this life? When we come to church, 
when we pray, what is it that you're looking for? Often the true answer comes as a revelation from God. What is it that people seek when they follow Jesus? Those disciples asked Jesus where he was staying. And Jesus doesn't answer directly, but issues an invitation that allows them to find the answer for themselves. Andrew and the other disciple were disciples of John the Baptist until they heard John say, look, here is the Lamb of God. John had a mission greater than himself. He came to prepare the way for another. The significance of his witness is that two disciples followed Jesus as a direct result of John's words. Now in the synoptic gospels, Matthew, uh, Mark, and Luke, the first disciples gave up their work as fishermen to follow Jesus. But in the fourth gospel, the gospel of John, they gave up a previous religious commitment as disciples of John the Baptist. And when Andrew and the other disciple left John and started following Jesus, John knew that's what was supposed to happen. Jesus was and is the big deal. John's job, as well as ours, is to point to the big deal, to point to Jesus. And we do that by witnessing who he is and how our lives have been changed because of him. And as I have said on many occasions, we are to be the hands and feet of Christ in the world, not only feeding the hungry and clothing the naked, but standing up for what is right and what is biblical. We are connected to someone much bigger than us and our lives take on meaning when we engage in God's mission. We find our true epiphany when we find our place in God's world. In 1882, Reverend Alexander Crummel preached a sermon called The Lamb of God. I want to close with some of his words this morning. But now the invitation comes to every soul. Behold the Lamb of God. Summon all the scattered, wasted powers of your heart and fasten them upon Christ. He is able and willing to save every person from themselves and from their sins in time and for eternity. You ask, have we nothing to do but look? And what is there in looking that can serve to change the heart or save the mind. Why don't you see that if you sit and gaze upon the Lamb of God, 
Look with all your heart, your mind, and your soul. Look with all your sorrows and desires. Look with all your tears and all your longing upon your Savior that this is believing in him and accepting him as your master and your all. Salvation comes by looking. Sight is the most vivid and most transforming of all our senses, the soul's mightiest organ for understanding. So the Bible teaches us that by, by, by beholding a thing, we become like unto it. Thus, beholding the Lamb of God saves people. If you want salvation, look to Jesus. We are all called to say to all those within hearing distance, hey, look, see, God is alive. God is in our midst. The Holy Spirit is at work in us, and through us, and for us, and in spite of us. Thanks be to God. Amen and amen.